Well, Father, I just want to thank you this morning for the privilege and the honor to stand behind this pulpit, Lord, and to present your word, your word that brings life, your word that is light-giving. It says that the entrance of your word brings light. I thank you that today the entrance of your word is going to give us direction. Your word uh, brings life, God, where there's been death. God, I thank you that life is going to come forth. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, I just yield to you this morning, and I ask that, Holy Spirit, that we would be able not only to hear the heart of God, but to feel the heart of God this morning. And I pray that you would awaken us, that you would anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. That God, just like in days of old, I remember hearing when the minister preached about falling into the hands of an angry God, that Lord, the whole place was set on fire. God, people felt the conviction of God. And I pray this morning that God, that we would hear the word of the Lord and God, and we would so go forth boldly, boldly into this world that you've called us to go into without fear, without shame. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Probably got you all scared on that, you know, hands of the, being in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> uh, I am going to be talking to you this morning about as in the days of Noah. And um, <clears throat> there's an image. Do you, do you see that image, Miss Angelica, that Greg put in there for me by chance? I'll let you find that if hopefully you find that. Um, there we go. I, sorry, I'm still in the classroom mode. So here is old Noah. And Noah was commissioned by God, right? So um, go ahead and just leave that, leave that on the screen because this, is really, this, is, this whole picture is really what I want to address this morning and where we are at in this picture. But um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm going to just jump in and start reading because I have several scriptures that I want to get to this morning. Just to kind of lay a foundation, um, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, uh, starting with verse 14, don't team up with those who are unbelievers, for how can righteousness be a partner with the wickedness, and how can light live with darkness, and what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. For as God has said, I will live in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Verse 17. Therefore, come out from among the believer, unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, it's so interesting, you know, when I look at words, sometimes that's in the word of God and how Satan likes to hijack words and he likes to hijack God's things, right? Didn't he hijack the rainbow? And here when God is saying, therefore, come out from among the unbelievers. You know, that's a whole movement. It's called the coming out. It's a LGBTQ, LGBT, that. <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> that movement. But it's a coming out, right? There's, they're trying to, it's, it's called the coming out movement where they're coming out without fear, with pride, about their lifestyle that they are living in same-sex uh, relationships as, and in families, and it's a big movement called the coming out. Well, I would like to know when the coming out of the believers movement is going to begin. They are living very braggadocious, very unfearful, and, you know, I, I don't say that to be critical of them because they are, they are people that need truth. They need Jesus Christ. And, um, but I will say that they shame the church because they are so unashamed to go out and proclaim their lifestyle that they've chosen to live. Yet we as Christians sometimes are so afraid that someone might find out we're a Christian 
or they might just find out what we stand or what we believe on an issue. You know, we're afraid to post that life is precious, that the unborn child needs to be protected. Why? Because we've got, you know, it's a big movement about a woman's right to choose. Well, come on church, we have to stand and come out and be separate from the world, declaring the truth of what God's word says. And it's my goal this morning, I pray, to just stir you up, to awaken you up. You know, I've been raised in church all my life. I, you know, I, I used to, you know, play or sleep under the, pinch, the benches and pick the gum off and chew it. I couldn't believe somebody <laughs> left me the multitude of bubble gum. You know, I've been around the church world. I've, I've, seen, I've seen the moves of God. I, I was uh, born again in 1977 in, in a ministry of David Wilkerson. I got b- uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was, I was nine. I got baptized around the age of 12. You know, I was on fire for Jesus. I, you know, and, and I've seen the great moves in the 80s and in the 90s and the things that God's done. And, and somewhere the church, we became professional. Somewhere the worship became professional. We have to have paid musicians to play, you know, uh, the perfect sound. We have to sound just like the team that wrote the song. I am not a professional. That is not what my goal is to sound professional up here. My goal is to bring you into the presence of God Almighty. And somehow we, we've become so articulate, we've become so, so, I don't know, so desensitized by coming into church that, that we come in here and we're one person and we leave and we're another person. Somewhere we leave Christianity in the church and we pick it up when we come back on the next Sunday. But it's time for us, as, as God said in his word, to come out from the unbelievers And to separate ourselves from them, says the Lord, and do not even touch their filthy things. Well, we could go all day talking about the filthy things. You know, in the movie industry, in the music industry, um, even we're seeing it now happen in the sports industry. You know, they're making everything very political. You know, there's, it it, it just, it's all around us. And it's as in the days of Noah. And, um, and so what the Lord wants me to really minister to you this morning is what does it mean to separate yourself from the world? Look in over with me at, in the Gospel of John. I'm going to skip over my notes here. Um, John chapter 17. This is Jesus' prayer just before he is betrayed and arrested and and he's praying for his disciples. It's a powerful prayer. And um, I I would encourage you to read the whole prayer, but I'm going to um, pick it up in verse 6. He says, I've revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. And now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I have passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and they know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world. Isn't that interesting? God loves the world, but he's saying this this prayer It's not for the world, but I'm praying for those you've given me because they belong to you. Now, all who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me. So they bring me glory. Now I'm departing from this world and they are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you, Holy Father, and you've given me your name and now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. And during my time here, I've protected them by the power of the name you gave me. And I guarded them so that no one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold, talking about Judas. Verse 13, now I'm coming to you, and I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so that they would be filled with my joy. And I've given them your word, and the world hates them, Because they do not belong to the world, 
just as I do not belong to the world. Now, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Now, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth, just as you sent me into the world. I am sending them into the world, and I give by myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be, may be made holy by your truth. And I love this part because here's you and me. And I'm praying not for only these disciples, but also for all who will ever hear and believe in me through their message. Amen. So that's telling us that what Jesus just prayed is spoken to you and me. Amen. Now, the thing is, is that we can, we can look at this this not being of the world, being separate. We just talked about that in over here in the other scripture, how we've got to be separate, come out of the world. And then here we find God is saying, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to protect them in the world. And the thing that Jesus says is I really want you to see is that you are not of the world, but you are here for the world. You are not of the world. You don't, you don't, God, Satan is the God of this world, the Bible says. And, and there is an agenda that he has that's being played out, that's coming, just, just bringing into the last days of Jesus Christ. And we, we are, as the church, have to stand like this man, Noah. Noah in the, in the Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that Noah obeyed God. He obeyed God even when it had never rained. He didn't even know what rain was. It had never rained upon the earth. It, the water came up out of the ground. And Noah is building this boat that's so enormous. I'm going to have Pastor Mark build us an ark for our class. <laughs> That would be so awesome. Uh, I'm going to come up with something for that, though. But when you see the dynamics of how huge this boat is, and he built it not on water, but he built it in a, in a valley in a, on land. And, um, you know, and it didn't just take a few, uh, a few months. Noah heard the word of God. And he obeyed the word of God for what the Bible, we, most scholars believe, was over a hundred years. Hey, you guys are back. Welcome back, Dave. And, oh, hey, guys. <laughs> Sorry. And so Noah was preaching. The Bible says also that Noah was a preacher. Peter said he's a preacher of righteousness. And while Noah is building his boat in the middle of a barren land, um, which makes no sense at all, for over 120 years approximately, he is preaching about the coming judgment that God is going to destroy the earth. And you can see in this picture, which I love, is that they are laughing at him that this man is lost it. He is crazy. What is he doing building this enormous boat in the middle of nowhere? And sometimes God, you know, I'm just going to throw this in there. Sometimes God gives us a command or he gives us a vision. He gives us a purpose. And we think that it's going to come forth in the first season or, or maybe the next season will come forth. Or, you know what I'm saying? We keep waiting year after year after year after year. And, and it's like, man, I guess I really missed it. I thought for sure it was going to happen by now. Well, good old Noah right here, thank God he never lost his focus. Amen. And the Bible tells us that it was because he had faith in God. He moved with the fear, built the ark to the saving of his family while all of the world around him was mocking him, laughing at him, and thinking that he had lost it. Well, in Matthew chapter 24... Jesus said, talking about the last days, he said, it will be like the days of Noah. And this is a big sign for you and me that when we see the days approaching us like as the days of Noah, and, um, and turn, well, let's look at that. Turn with me to Genesis chapter six. Let's just take and see, because I think you can clearly see that we are living in days like Noah's days. 
In Genesis chapter six, um, I'm just gonna pick it up with verse five. Now the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness upon the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil so that the Lord was sorry he had made them and he put them on, that he put them on the earth. And I love this, the NLT says, and it broke his heart. Here God is seeing the heart of man wicked and the heart of God is broken because we, you know, we learn that what happens is that God's intention in the beginning in Genesis, we, God's intention was that everything he did was good, that God made a good earth. God made man after his image and everything was good. And now we find that God is saying, now he sees this creation that he's created is consistently, constantly, always evil. Every thought, every imagine. And it goes on and says, now the Lord said, I will wipe out the human race that I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, even the birds of the sky. And I'm sorry I ever made them. Now you may think, I don't know, maybe, I don't know who's in this room. I know that the world thinks this is just a fairy tale story. And when we get into our class next month, whoo I'm going to show you some great things, the evidences that the world will not tell you, the evidence of a worldwide flood. And God and Jesus himself, he quotes and says, as in the days of Noah, Jesus is not going to reference something that was a fairy tale. Jesus is saying, as in the days of Noah, Jesus is verifying that the story of Noah was a real and true story. It happened. But the Bible says in verse 8, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Now, this is the account of Noah and his family. And here's what I really want you to get to. The Bible says Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time. Can you imagine? Thank God we have each other in this room. Can you imagine being the only blameless person living on the face of the earth? We're talking a lot of those as his family, right? Aunts, uncles, I don't know who's all there cousins. And and he's the only one that is righteous and blameless before God. I mean, the the weight of that, I, you know, some of you work in places that are, is very evil. It's very dark. I know when I worked in a secular field, you know, I worked in the medical field and, you know, um, there's not a lot of faith in that. You know, it's a very factual, you know, a world. And, um, it's a very, can, in, in any job, you can be in a very ungodly place. And, and it's very hard sometimes to let your light shine in such a dark place. It's kind of easier just to kind of lay low. But God is saying we need Noah's. We need Noah's to rise up. It says, and here's, here's a really big key that it says that, that Noah was the only man, blameless person, living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. And it says, Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt. It changed itself. And it was filled with violence, right? And God observed that all this corruption in the world for everyone on the earth was corrupt. I mean, do you not see a time in a generation of corruption across the board of our world? And this corruption has has invaded homes. It's invaded the lives of our children where they're taking what, to corrupt is to take what the natural use is, what what it's made to be, and to change it into something different. And this is a very telltale of the last days of Jesus. He's saying that in the last days, people are going to be uh, corrupt. They're going to be, uh, corruption will fill the earth and violence I mean, we're living in a very violent time. We, you know, we just a few back, uh, years back, we can go back when, when all these, you know, um, horrible, um, what's that called? The, um, 
Yes, riots, thank you, were happening all across our nation. Of course, there's wars happening. The Bible, Jesus said, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be earthquakes in diverse places. I mean, come on, we saw the weirdness of the Maui fire. We saw what happened in Libya. Thousands and thousands of people drown and bodies are still floating, you know, to, to come up to the, you know, to the surface. And I mean, just these major tragedies that are happening, happening. And, and all the time I ask you, are you aware? Are you aware of the times that we're living in? The Bible tells us also, Jesus said, uh, back to my picture here, Jesus said that when, when Noah was building the boat up to the very day that they went into the boat, Jesus said that they were marrying and given in marriage. They were partying. They were doing everything in life. They were not altered by his message at all. They weren't listening to his message. But, you know, I'm not preaching to the world in here. I'm preaching, I believe, to the church, right? I'm preaching to my Noah, my Noah group right here. And, and we have to be the ones that regardless of how they receive the message, regardless if they mock us, because we know they will, regardless if they hear us, we have to be faithful to stand like Noah, to preach the truth that there is coming a judgment to judge this world. And Jesus said that in the, and Paul, uh, Peter, I believe, said that in the last days that this judgment's not going to be a flood, it's going to be a fire that's going to consume this world and purify it. And then God says, I will make a new heaven and a new earth. I'm telling you, this is not an hour to backslide. <clears throat> This is not an hour to think that, oh, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'm just been too tense. I've been, I've been too religious. No, keep being religious. Keep, keep holding on to the truth of God's word. And it, it's so hard sometimes for us to, to really see what's happening around us because we just, like I said, we become acclimated. But you need to wake up and see that God warned us of these days, that these days were coming. Be like Noah, stand faithful, be blameless, be righteous. How? How do I stay righteous in this generation? I walk with God. Amen. That's how he did it. He walked in close fellowship with God. You will not make it if you don't know how to pray. If you don't know how to get in God's word. If you can't walk with him. And you know, and, and God is so amazing. You know, when you walk with him, you know, the Bible tells us that, that we are not like those who live in the world in darkness, but we're children of light. We're not going to stumble. We see the things that are coming and we begin to prepare ourselves and we draw closer to God. And, you know, I, I was telling my husband that I, I really, I know we all talk about, I can't wait to meet, you know, good old Paul. And I can't wait to meet all these different people, disciples in the Bible, Noah, Moses. But, you know, I'm thinking they can't wait to meet you. Because we're living in the last days. We are living in a time that there is such distractions, Right? It's even sitting on the pulpit with me. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Got this thing right here in front of me. It's because I was going to use it for the bulletin. But this, this is a, a tremendous distraction. This is a window. I mean, I love how it's called windows, like, you know, windows. And, and it's called the, the mighty web, you know. Um, you know, the, these are windows that the enemy can get into our life. The, this little phone can cause a lot of problems, has caused a lot of problems, Right? I mean, not just, the, not just that, but, but distractions. I mean, are you so busy like me? I, I mean, do you feel like you're just so busy sometimes? It's like, I got to figure out where I'm going to carve in Jesus today. I, just, I mean, everything keeps, keeps, keeps piling up. And I believe, like I said, that, that, that these, these uh, all of who have gone before us, when we get there, are going to say, how did you do it? How did you make it? How did you come through? And we're going to have to be the ones that said, I chose to walk with Jesus. I just stayed right by him. When he moved, I moved. If he didn't move, I didn't move. If he said go, I went. And I learned to walk with him, to listen to him, to heed his warnings, and not to be distracted by, by the distractions of the world. Now, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 2, and let's look at a little more in the end times. Um, 
You know, the great thing about this is that we as a body of believers in that Harvest Bible Church, we believe in the rapture of the church. Amen. And, um, you know, we believe that, that Jesus is coming. And I love our really good friend. Um, I can't remember his name at the something Morris, Joe Morris, that, you know, has come and taught us about that. You know, this is not an escape theology. It's, it's a time that we're really honing in. You know, we're really focusing, going to make that final touchdown. I don't know. Um, but this is the hour that we are, you know, we're really pressing in because Jesus is coming. Everything that we see lining up, for in the Bible that's prophesying about the coming of Jesus Christ is actually talking about his second coming, that he's going to come to rule and reign on the earth. And so what, so if that's lining up for his second coming, the rapture happens just a little bit before that, seven years before, because we'll be, we'll be with him in heaven. And so, um, so this is an exciting day. It's not a, a day to be afraid. It's not a day to, to, uh, to just worry, it's a time that we really hone in. And um, Peter says this in chapter three, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember. I mean, that should be right across the back here. Pastor Mark and I, that's what we want to do. We try to stimulate your wholesome thinking, refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded, commanded through your apostles. And most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. And they will say what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. Now, what's scary about this right here, he's not talking about the world that's mocking. He's talking about those that are Christians. Those, he says, these are, matter of fact, he's talking about here in the Jews, he said, they're, they're saying that the Jewish nation, that before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same. So they, they believe in the, in the creation, that God's the creator. They believe that there was a promise that God had made, but they've, they become uh, mockers and scoffers because like Noah, they haven't held out that God is true, that what he said he's going to do, he's going to do. And it's very easy for you and I to say, oh my gosh, I've heard them talk about the rapture so many times. I've heard about the, the end, end of the world. And I'm telling you, I have too. I've been preaching it for years, but I've never seen it like it is today. I've never seen it so vile. I've never seen it so blatant, so out in our face. So, you know, uh, the enemy's not even trying to masquerade anymore. So it's time that you and I do not masquerade anymore. And Noah, he remained faithful and true, even though the promise was, it seemed like it was delayed. It seemed like it wasn't coming and, the, and they were mocking him, yet he held to what God had said, and he finished what he was supposed to do to build the ark. And then what happened? It rained, it flooded, and everybody who was not in the ark died. All the animals, all of them perished except for Noah and his family. Now, I, I, when, when Jesus says that it's as is in the days of Noah, and it's only Noah and his family was saved, it makes me wonder in these last days, is there really a multitude of people that are going to be saved? Or is it just, just the, the narrow road? Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And you know, we have to be faithful regardless to preach the truth that Jesus is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is, I just feel the spirit of the Lord on that. Jesus is coming. Heaven is preparing. They are getting ready. He's getting ready to come and take his bride that is spotless, without spot and wrinkle, the Bible says. Why? Because she has prepared herself. Have you been preparing yourself for the marriage supper of the Lamb? Or are you living in the world? Because it, it says that we live in the world, but we're supposed to be separate apart from them. Have you been, been being so influenced by the world that you're, 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 just, you're more like the world than you are like Jesus? 
And this is where we have to prepare ourselves because why? Jesus is coming. Let me go on and read this. They say that from the times of our ancestors, everything's remained the same since the world was first created. Well, there's a first mistake right there. When the world was first created, there was no sin. Everything was perfect. But that is not the end of the story. We know that sin came into the world and it became corrupt. And verse 5 says, Now they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. He brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. And then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But listen, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. I love this. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. For the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some think. I think even here, he's not being slow. He says, no, he's being patient. He was patient while he waited Noah to build the boat, the Bible says. Because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. For the day the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, notice church, What holy and godly lives you should live. What holy and godly lives. Have you become calloused to sin? You know, sin is what we just read in Genesis chapter 6 that grieved and broke the heart of God. It breaks his heart. Sin breaks the heart of God. So if you live in sin and you participate in sin as a Christian, the Bible says you're grieving and you're breaking the very heart of God. I don't want to break his heart. I don't want to grieve him. And it says that, it goes on and says, um, looking forward to the day of God, hurrying it along on that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames But I love this, but here's the promise. We are looking forward to the new heavens, the new earth that he's promised, a world filled with God's righteousness. You know, I I love this. I love, like I said, teaching the kids because we really nail the point that in the beginning when God created the earth, the heavens, everything was perfect. It was good. And then it became corrupt. And when it became corrupt because of sin, death, sickness, disease, anger, violence, All of that came into the world and it it begins to play out through all the world that God had promised that there was going to be a redeemer and that Jesus came. He truly came. He redeemed us and that all who believe in him, he takes the punishment deserved that we deserve because of Adam's sin. He takes the punishment for us. And now we, when we receive him, stand righteous, which means I stand right with God. And it doesn't end there. And as we continue to move forward, we find that we're going to one day live with God in a new heaven on a new earth forever we shall be. The Bible says there'll be no more sorrow, no more grieving, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. Hallelujah. No more sickness, no more cancers, no more of that junk. It'll be, it'll be as if he made it in the beginning. It'll be perfect. But we've got to have our garments spotless and without wrinkle. We've got to be preparing for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know I won't, I won't read all of this, but um, the Bible also tells us about other people that kind of stayed separate from the world. What about Daniel? Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought into Babylon And there they were told that they were supposed to eat from the king's table and they would be trained in the wisdom of Babylon. And it says that that Daniel didn't protest to being trained in Babylon wisdom, but he did protest to eating their food because that would have been a violation to his belief. 
And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to eat the, drink the wine and eat the food, the meat from the king's table. They ate what they would normally eat. And the Bible says that they were healthier and stronger than all the others. They separated themselves. And then the Bible tells us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we find over, I believe, in chapter 3, we find that there they are, and Neb King Nebuchadnezzar builds this big 90-foot golden image. We'll have Pastor Mark build that for us, too. <laughs> I'm all about visuals. <laughs> I sing Cropper raise his hand, so you'll be joining him. I love it. Okay. All right. A 90-foot golden image, and Nebuchadnezzar said, I want everybody, when you hear the sound of the music, I want you to bow down and worship this golden image. And the instruments began to play. Everybody fell down on their face, worshiping, giving their faith, giving their honor, giving glory to this stupid golden image. I asked my kids, it has eyes, but can it see? No. It has a mouth, can it speak? No. It's just a handmade, man-made golden image that they were commanded to worship, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They separated themselves again. They refused to bow down to this image. And because of that, the king became so angry, right? It says that he, he caused the, the oven to be uh, heated up seven times hotter than it was already. And he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. When you hear the sound of the worship music, I want you to bow down and worship the golden image. And I love it because they, as a matter of fact, let me read what they say because they're, what they say is so bold. Um, it's in Daniel, Hosea, there we go. I love this. They said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied this. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. This is the kind of tenacity that you and I had to have to have in this hour. That no matter what the world is saying to us, that they want us to bow into their golden image. They want us to yield ourselves, to put down our faith. You can have faith in, in, in Muhammad. You can have faith in Buddha. You can have faith in anybody but Jesus Christ in this world. Or they get angry at you, right? Am I right? People lose their jobs because they, they pray what? They pray to Jesus. And so they want us to bow, but we have to be like Noah. We've got to be like Daniel. We've got to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and says, look, I'm not going to do it. Now, God is able to serve me, but even if he does not, we will not worship the idol that you have set before us. And, and the story has a great ending, hallelujah, praise God, because then we find that they, they put, you know, hats and wrapped them in coats and they threw them into that old, you know, uh, blazing furnace and the men that threw them in, they died because it was so strong and powerful. But what did you see walking around? They're looking and going, oh my goodness. I see four Men walking around in the midst of that furnace, and the one is like the Son of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. You see, when we would have the faith, do you believe that your God can defend you? Do you believe that your God can protect you? Do you believe what his word says is going to happen will happen? We have to have faith that God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. And no matter what comes and is spoken by the world, I will put my faith in him. Amen. It goes on with Daniel, goes on a little further, I believe in chapter six, that now Daniel is, you know, he, people were jealous of him and they wanted to trap him, right? We're talking about people being separated unto God. And it says that they wanted to entrap Daniel and the only way they could do that was by doing something against his religion. Does that sound a little familiar? And that was the strategy of that day. This is what they said. The administrators and high officials began searching for some fault with Daniel, who was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn him. 
He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. That's, he's living in the world, right? He's living with Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. You can still work in the kingdom of the world without being of the world. Amen. And it says, so they concluded that our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. We just saw this demonstrated in the last few years. The only way to shut down the church is to deal with the rules of religion. You can't meet together. And it says, but here's what I love, because this is really what we did too. The, the order went out that whoever does it will be cast right into the, into the lion's den. And as soon as that order was given, they're looking for Daniel to find out where Daniel was. And it says here, when Daniel, verse 10, when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home. He knelt down as usual in his upper upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem because here was, the, here was the law. The law was you can't pray to any divine or human person except the king. So they were going to entrap him on prayer. But Daniel goes home as was his regular thing to do. He knelt down, he prayed, he opened his windows towards Jerusalem as he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. And then they came to his house and they found him praying. So they throw him in the lion's den. I mean, Daniel refused to change his faith and his belief in God. He was in the world, but he was not of the world. He was in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, but he was not of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the same thing. They were there, but they didn't submit to, to whenever it came against their belief system in God, they separated themselves. No, I can't be like that. No, I can't eat that. No, I can't worship like that. No, I can't not stop praying to my God. It's a separation. And God wants you and me to be people in this hour who are willing to stay separate from the world. You know, I, I, um, I, I know there's a big word called influencers, right? All your younger people know what influencers are. <laughs> influencers, they get paid money when you watch them on TikTok videos and they're telling you about the greatest way to lose weight or how to grow a bigger mustache and you watch them. <laughs> And then you see if I get the same supplements that they have, my mustache will grow bigger or my belly will grow smaller. And so they influence. And then the more influence that they have, the more people like them, the more money that the companies will pay them. You know, that sounds like Satan's good deal to me. You know, he sends, he sends us influencers, people that, that make, man, Satan can make it sound so good just like he did to Eve in the beginning. But you and I, we need to be very cautious and very, very walking with God, it said, as Noah did. He walked with God in fellowship with him. Daniel prayed three times a day. If you do not have a lifestyle of prayer now, you think you're going to jump into it at the very end and, and make it? Crisis prayer time? Oh, God, help me. <laughs> we do that, don't we? But we have got to develop a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of not just coming to church, but being involved and responding to this message is responding in our worship service, responding, not just coming here to think you're listening to some great, you know, get good and God loves you and go be blessed. No, I want to stir you up. Pastor Mark wants to stir you up. We have a job to do. And the job Jesus said that, Lord, they're not in this world. They're not of this world as I was not of the world, but I am sending them into the world. You have a job. You have a, a, a mission. And this mission is this world. You are not to be like the world. You are to be preaching like Noah did. A man of righteousness. Jesus is coming. You need to get right with God. You know, and that's why I love our, our uh, School of the Bible classes, because it really does teach you how to share Christ with people. Amen? Amen. Well, five, uh, five more things, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I won't go on. I just want to end, end with this. Is in the days of Noah, put your spiritual routine in place. Make a determination to honor God above all. Separate yourselves from this world. Walk in a daily relationship with Jesus. 
Preach the word to the lost. Don't be influenced by ungodliness. Obey even when we see no evidence like Noah. And lastly, have faith in your God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning. There's so much we could talk about with the world and, and even the, the, the word of God that you've given us, the precious promises of God that gives us that divine nature to escape the corruption of the world. Oh, there's just so much in your word. God, I pray that you would just put a hunger in every man, every woman's heart right now. You didn't send your son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Jesus, the world hated you because you were light and you exposed their wickedness. You exposed their evil deeds. And so the world will hate us because here we are shining the light of Jesus Christ. And people, the Bible says, love their wickedness more than they love the light. And so God, I pray that Lord, that we would just have hearts this morning towards you, that we would be persevering like Noah, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we would stand in the hour where we may be mocked, we may be ridiculed, we may look like the fool because we're preaching something that's been preached for years, but we believe your word. And so, Father, we ask that uh, Jesus is coming. The alarm just went off. Oh. <laughs> uh. We just ask that, God, we would be ready as your church and as your bride, that, God, we would just, we would wash our garments by the washing of the water of your word, that we would purify our hearts. And if we're a sin, if we're doing things in, in a sinful lifestyle, God, we want to repent and we want to do what's right. We want to be right before you. We don't want to have garments that are spotted by the world, but to be that pure bride that stands before you waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Make us like Noah to preach in this hour. Make us like Daniel to pray in this hour. Make us like Shadrach and Meshach to not bend our knee in this hour to the ungodliness of this world. We love you and we honor you, Father. And we want all of our life to honor you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you know, I don't, know everyone in this room, I want to give you an opportunity. Just as we saw in that picture, Noah, I'm a, I'm a Noah today. I'm telling you judgment's coming. I'm telling you the world is going to end. We're seeing, you know, the Bible is the best prediction. It's predicted these days, and the prediction is not great for the future, but not for us as the Christians. The, oh, the future is promising. The future is beautiful. If there's anyone in this room that you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to get right with him. Or maybe you've been living the wrong lifestyle. Maybe you're not living for Jesus and you should be living for Jesus. You know how you should be living, but you've walked away from living with right. I want to give you the opportunity to make it right before God, to be unashamed in this moment to say, God, yes. I want to serve you. If there's anyone in this room uh, with a lifting up of your hand, just so I know that I can pray with you, you could just lift your hand and I will pray with you. Is there anyone in this room that's not ready to meet Jesus? Let me say it this way. If you die right now, when the, you walk out this door, if you die, do you know where you'll spend eternity? Do you know if you will make heaven? Because if you don't know that you'll make heaven, then you need to know that you'll make heaven. And we can do that today by praying with you. Is there anyone in this room that said, if, you know, Pam, if I died, I don't know if I'd make it. Anyone by the raising of your hand so I can pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing, this time of the service for you, for me, when you think about eternity, just go ahead and look at me for a minute. Because this moment right now is going to be opened when you stand before God. And the books, the Bible says, the books will be open. And you're, this moment in time when God says, look, I was telling you, I was reaching out for you to be saved. And you refused me. Can you imagine, no, I don't even want to imagine the horror of knowing that I missed the opportunity because I was ashamed, 
I didn't believe it. Don't be ashamed. I mean, all of us have made that, that walk with Christ and, and everything that the Bible says is going to happen and it's real. So church, for you, I just commissioned to go into the world and to preach his gospel, amen? amen? To declare the truth of who he is. Please do not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Amen. I mean, you don't have to go around wearing a shirt that says, I'm a Christian. Amen. Just act like one. Amen. Speak like one. Live like one. That people, when they accuse you, the accusation will be, man, she is so much like Jesus. He is so much like Jesus. Amen. Well, Father, I do, I just, I just give a final blessing upon them tonight, God, or this morning. Bless them. God, let this word just take root. And Father, we just, we want to, we want to be a pure and spotless bride. We honor you and we love you in the powerful name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, if you could just wait one second, uh, Sam has something he wants to share. Yes, I do. And normally, this isn't my Sunday that I usually stand up and say something because we've already got the message. But I'll just want to share this with you this morning. I got up about 6.30 and got all uh, ready for coming to church and and usually when I get up that early, I get my coffee ready and do this and do that and read my word, do my devotion. But this morning, I walked to my chair and the Lord said, I don't want you to read this morning. I don't want you to read this morning. I want you to sit down and meditate on me. So I sat down and Naturally, your head starts giving you problems from every which direction. And, and basically, finally, I, I got the revelation what he was trying to say, and it really lines up with what Pastor Pam was preaching today. And I didn't know what she was going to preach on. But in this, uh, just to let you know, I've been born again for about 40, 45 years. And... The trail wasn't always easy for me even being born again. I had to do a lot of changing in my life. And this morning when he showed me, and this was, and I seen this actually in a clear, clear vision, I'll call it. And if I hadn't seen it, I would never give it thought to myself, but it was actually for me also. And everyone knows the stories about the ten virgins, Everyone knows about one will be left and the other one taken. Everyone knows those things. And as Pastor Pam was preaching, I just, I, I couldn't handle it anymore. I said, I got I to gotta share this. But in that vision, this is what I seen. And it was at an airport. Everybody was getting ready to get aboard. And basically, there were a lot of people. It was a big plane, a lot of people. You know, God's got big planes. And, he, and he, we travel a lot of times with big planes, and we travel a lot. But anyway, in this, all of a sudden, a voice said, everyone down on your face. Well, the first thing, I'm there. What's the first thing you think of hijacked? They're hijacking the plane. And in actuality, that's what the Holy Ghost was doing. He was hijacking the plane. But everybody down on your face, why was that? Because wide is the gate and narrow is the pathway. And as I'm meditating on that, he's, a door opened on the plane, ready to abort. And basically, on our faces, we couldn't see who it was or who was getting on the plane, but names were called out. Names were called out. They kept calling names, kept calling names. I'm, I'm down on the ground with my face on the carpet. And names were calling, names were calling. I don't know how many, I don't know how many, I just know how many folks were there. And all of a sudden, I heard the door slam. 
and I'm still down on the carpet with my face. How many of you believe in second chances here? I've had a lot of second chances and maybe even third, fourth, I'm not sure. But I use, I use quite a few of them. Second chances, and I heard the plane winding up, ready to about take off, and all of a sudden the door slammed open. I don't see nobody there, but the door slammed open, and they called my name. Second chances. Second chances, folks. Are you ready for that second chance? And I mean, this morning, we heard a message. I'm telling you, we got to be ready for that second chance. And I haven't heard it more clearly than I heard it this morning when I was meditating. I didn't read the word. I didn't do that. But he showed me in that meditation that we have to get ready. Amen. And we're close. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we are going to give you a second chance. We're going to have our prayer team go ahead and come on up here, as they always do after every service. Hallelujah. Let's all stand up. Let's all stand. Prayer team, go ahead and come. And if you needed to talk or you needed to share, these men and women are tremendous blessings. Thank God for the word that's challenged you this morning. Hallelujah. But you come and you let them pray. Let them believe God with you. Amen. Listen, I love you. God loves you. You be blessed today. You're dismissed.